I showed a, a, a cycle previously for DevOps, um, and it looked very much like this. Maybe the term, the names were slightly different, but it broadly followed the same thing. Our version of this for data ops is very similar. The main areas that are different are around environment management and tests. We use a hashtag true data ops, and the reason for this being, if you go and search for data ops on the internet, you'll find 50 different definitions. 49 of them disagree with each other, and almost all of them we think are wrong. And, and the reason most of them are wrong, in our humble opinion, is because they all start with the premise of data. They all effectively start with the point of view that this is how data has always worked. How do we sprinkle a bit of DevOps over the top? How do we make our data process a bit DevOpsy? Our view is that that's a flawed approach. Whilst it's sim it's easy because say, hey, we can mostly carry on doing the way we doing things the way we've always done them. You will also not get most of the value out of it. Our approach was the opposite. We said, okay, this whole DevOps world and the philosophies and the tooling that underpin it have been around in some way, shape, or form for the best part of two decades now. They've been applied to different industries, they've been applied to different technologies. They're pretty battle-hardened and robust. Why don't we start with those as our baseline? Why don't we start with a very clean, true DevOps model as our baseline and just add the stuff to it that is needed to make it work for data? So we started with DevOps and made it work for data as opposed to starting with data and trying to sprinkle DevOps over the top. And that's, that's really the fundamental difference between us and the small number of other companies that are doing things in the DataOps area today. The data warehouse is no longer its own self-defining source of truth. It's just an engine. And we should never worry about this breaking or being out of date or someone accidentally deleting the table or any of that. We can, at the click of a button, basically deploy an entire data warehouse from the source of truth. Now, one thing I glossed over earlier by design was that actually I said the source of truth is our code repository. For a web server, that's absolutely true. For a video transcoding engine for Netflix, that's absolutely true. For a data pipeline, that's not quite true. The source of truth is actually the combination of everything that lives in my repository, which is how we move data about, how we transform it, and the source data systems themselves. It's the combination of those two that create my data warehouse source of truth. For example, I may make no changes to my code repository at all for a week and rerun the pipeline. What ends up in my data warehouse will be different. Why? Because the source data itself changed. If you think about that equation, my, my data warehouse source of truth is a code and repository source of truth plus a source system source of truth, add those two together, that's what creates my data warehouse at any point in time. And is used to continually regenerate my data warehouse. So I went through this process, I'll, I'll spend a little bit more time going through it. This is our UI. This is showing the various stages that we go through. All of the outputs are all in the system, so everything is logged. You don't need to go into any individual systems to see debugs and to see logging and see what's happening. It's all, it all comes up in real time in the browser. So, so this entire thing is called a pipeline. We'll talk about this more later. Each of these little boxes is a job, and a job gets executed on a runner. A runner is basically a document container or a VM running somewhere, but it runs wherever you like. It runs typically inside your firewall. So this is what gives us all of the capability to run as much complex stuff as you want, but run it on infrastructure, which is inside your execution environment, so inside your data centers, inside your private cloud. We get to choose where we run any one of these jobs. And of course, we can have, if you've got five data centers, three on-prem and two private cloud, we have a runner in each one, and we just choose where a particular job runs based on what it needs to do. If it needs to access the HR source system, which is in private cloud number two, then we will just tell it execute on the runner that is in private cloud number two. Ultimately, you know, this, this goes through, the, you know, these, these will run sequentially. Each of these columns is a stage. There's exceptions, but generally, you know, we don't move to a new stage until a previous stage is finished. We get real-time feedback. If, if any of these stages or jobs fail, the whole pipeline will stop unless we've explicitly said it's okay for this one to fail. The idea being that each of these stages is set up with success and failure criteria, if any of these fail, we should not be continuing because continuing means that we are pushing potentially bad data in front of the business user. And that's something we want to avoid at all costs. So what we're seeing running here, and we'll see more of this later, this is the, this is the execution output for one of our modeling and transformation jobs. We're seeing here that we've got some person data, so it's probably from an HR system. We can see we've got some ingestion and curation models. Under person ingestion, we've got address. So we've got a model for their address, and we can see it ran. We can see we've got a curation model for an address, and we can see it ran. So this is just showing what happens when we actually take all that source, and when we get the pipeline to compile it and execute it, these are the outputs we see. And as we saw at the end, all of that basically happens in the background. You, you know, unless you're doing development, or unless you get a, a, an alert that says something's gone wrong, you never really care about that. That's all stuff that happens automatically. And what you get at the end of it is a version of the production data warehouse that has been built completely from scratch. So that's partly, you know, a lot of what we're touching on here is environment management. Environment management is quite different in the data world because the concept of how do we create a complete new data warehouse or a virtual data warehouse to develop new stuff in or to, to, to populate new data in is quite different from how do I spin up a new web server. It was practically speaking until a few years ago, not really possible to do this. It's one of the things that Snowflake has enabled 
with all of their elasticity and their virtual warehousing concept is that we can now treat a Snowflake tenant a bit like a Kubernetes cluster and we can spin up dynamic workloads on it and then tear them down when we're done. This is part of the, one of the things that a pipeline does at the end of its execution is produce a, um, automated documentation. This is just one screenshot from it, but this is showing the modeling and transformations. And you remember when I showed the four layers of the MDA stack, inside each of those layers is a set of models. And consider a model at this point to be a table review, which is a pretty good approximation. There are some exceptions, but that works for most cases. So this is a set of tables and um, views which are inheriting from each other. This inheritance is absolutely critical. This is one of the most important areas when it comes to maintainability. This is one of the most fundamental concepts. It would be very, very straightforward for me to write a three or 400 line SQL view and put it in a consumption model and say, let's just run that. And that would work. And that would give the business the, the information they asked for today. However, let's think back to our discussion about maintainability. What happens, someone's written a three or 400 line SQL view that's got five joins and eight aggregate statements. We've all seen those, or most of us have seen those. You know, those are broadly not understandable by the person that wrote them a week later, let alone someone that has to come along six months time and try and extend it. You know, they are very, very hard to maintain, but it gets worse. What happens when I want something, the business says, hey, I, I want something nearly that data, but a little bit different. What do we do? We copy that 400 line SQL statement. We change five lines of it. Now we've got 396 shared lines and four change lines. So we've got a massive amount of duplication. The second I want to make a change that affects both of those or fix a bug that affects both of those, now I've got some detective job to do to try and track down, well, where did this start? How has it evolved over time? How many people have copied it? What changes have they made? Very, very, very quickly that implodes on itself. It just creates a complete un unmaintainable mess. The goal here is to break that down. We're not inventing any new concepts here. As a rule internally, whenever we come across a challenge in the data world, we try and say, okay, well, what's the analogy in the software world? How's the software world solved it? And the software world solved this years ago. No one writes a 1,000 line code function. And any manager that saw that in a code review would immediately reject it and say, go away and refactor this into 10 or 12 functions, each one of which is does a smaller subset of the overall whole. So in the software world, we've been doing this for a very long time. We said we create incredibly complicated systems. The complexity is emergent. We don't sit down and write complexity. We write lots and lots of simple Lego blocks, simple functions, 5, 10, 15, 20 lines. They do one thing. They do one thing well. They're easy to understand because they only do one thing. They're easy to maintain because they only do one thing. There's no duplication between them because they only do one thing. And then we achieve complex systems by assembling lots and lots of little building blocks. That's how the software world or the good software world has worked for many years. That's what we need to get. A 400 line SQL statement is bad. That 400 line SQL statement is trying to do 11 different things. Well, let's split those 11 different things into 11 different models. Let's make each one of those models do one thing. The next one inherits from that. The next one inherits from two previous ones and so on and build it all up. But each one of these, when we drill into them, will be doing a very small set of things, typically, ideally, only one thing, easy to understand, easy to maintain, and most critically of all, easy to write tests for. If you do a nine-way SQL join and you try and write a test that says, or a set of tests that say, what are valid outputs of this? It's almost impossible. The complexity of behavior is enormous. If I do a two-way SQL join, it's far easier for me to determine what is a valid outcome of that. So if I can turn a nine-way SQL join into a whole bunch of pairwise joins, yes, it's a few more steps, but ultimately I'm writing no more code, I'm just compartmentalizing it. But each one of those pairwise joins, I can now fairly straightforwardly write an automated test for. This design pattern is critically important. The system does not force you to do this. The system will allow you to write a 400 line SQL statement, but you're just not getting most of the value of the, of the data ops principles and philosophies that we strongly advocate. There are some stored procedures that are make my 400 line SQL view example look somewhat trivial. This is exactly the methodology that we would use for that. You know, we're not expecting to come out with a 2000 line SQL model. I'm expecting that that will produce 15, 20, 25 individual models. Each one of those is doing exactly one thing that can be easily defined, easy described, easy tested, and then we will build an emergent complex system out of those building blocks. The one thing I just wanted to mention, and it's one slide and I won't come back to it, is we talk about ELT. We say, let's grab all the source data and let load it without any changes and then transform it. That's our goal. There are some situations usually related to PIO information or PCI or GDPR. There is some information that people say, look, we can't put this data warehouse at all. A good example might be a credit card number. The way we would do this with, yeah, that we've done this for years with talent is, okay, even if we're trying to write ELT type jobs, we would still mask out certain fields. So we call this kind of E little t. There are some transformations you apply in line. They're certainly not structural. They're not grouping or aggregating or anything like that. They're typically obfuscating, anonymizing, masking type functions of sensitive data. This is a one side that just says, don't assume that ELT in practical terms means that everything has to come. 
there are usually a small set of things that you say, look, I'm going to bring 99.9% .9 of this, it's rule form, but there's 0.1% I need to mask out. That then becomes important how you mask it, because you want those masks to be deterministic. So I may not be able to see the credit card number, but I may want to see group by credit card number so I can see for an individual user how many transactions they've had. So I still want every credit card number. I don't want to put random numbers in here. I want, you know, like an MD5 checksum or something. So at least every credit card number is always going to turn to the same mask or obfuscated value.